I now look to Simon Evans to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like the record to show that Mr Evans rose to his feet and spoke for several minutes without referring to notes or indeed any other visible evidence of having prepared in any way whatsoever. <laughs> I do have a couple of notes, but before I address them uh, or refer to them, I would just like to thank Mr Corbyn for his speech. Some of you may superficially have struggled to see what bearing the things he said. <laughs> had on the issue at hand. However, at a more profound level, of course, they did address the, uh, the proposition that the House regrets the success of its friends. Because, of course, he could see that we were proposing that and would therefore feel regret should we not indeed enjoy success and see it instead go to the other side, he very generously fell on his sword <laughs> that we might indeed avoid that regret. And he, of course, not feeling that such regret is in fact a valid or a real thing, as the young people say, has no fear of it. Regret is the first of the three propositions that I wish to disassociate from the underlying uh, general proposition that the House regrets the success of its friends. There are three core elements to that proposition, separated as they are by the rubble of conjunctives, prepositions, and pronouns. Success, friends, and regret. And regret is perhaps the most controversial of all of them. It's used, I think, in this motion in a somewhat ironic and dry way, rather than say, as Ava really did, bitterly, bitterly despise your friends. We say we regret the success of our friends because it sounds slightly better mannered, but of course, despising them is what we're really talking about. <laughs> regret is a much subtler and actually more human emotion, and one I think we should genuinely countenance. Uh, I remember, I think two and a half years ago, oh, may I just say on the political thing before I come to this, I would also add my, my name to the uh, roster of those who would advise you to vote Labour. Nobody, <laughs> nobody under the age, nobody under the age of 25 and still reliant on the state for any sort of support should vote Conservative. It would be obscene. Really, you should start voting Conservative when you're about 30, ideally. Um, <laughs> Never trust anyone who's still voting Labour over 30, I would say that's certainly true, but from your point of view, you're in great luck at this election because you can vote Labour with a clean conscience, knowing that it will reflect well on you as an individual without there being any danger whatsoever <laughs> of a Labour government actually coming to power. So that's that out of the way. But the previous attempt uh, of the Labour government to get into power was uh, just over two years ago. Ed Miliband, of course, uh, was leading the party at that time. And as part of his party's attempt to persuade the people that they should vote to him, he appeared on Desert Island Discs. Desert Island Discs is a Radio 4 programme which is best, I think, when the guest is uh, towards the, the, the sort of sunset of their career and is able to recollect in tranquility the achievements, the love affairs, the disappointments and so on that have woven into the rich tapestry of their life. It's at its worst when it's an attempt to frame ambition as approachability, which is what is usually the case when a, a member of parliament is appearing on it uh, who still hopes to be on the upward trajectory. Ed Miliband made what I felt was one of the most beautiful uh, expressions of ignorance that I've ever heard a politician allowed to say on, on public uh, broadcasts. He said um, his fourth record, I think it was, was Je ne regrette rien <laughs> by Edith Piaf, a great uh, torch song, a ballad of thwarted love, which Edith nevertheless would never have done anything differently. Je ne regrette rien. She used to really roll her R's that much. And the host, uh, Kirsty, something, I think, on that program, asked Ed Miliband why he had chosen it. And he said, well, Kirsty, it's been one of my greatest regrets in life that I've never learned to speak French. <laughs> the layers of irony in that remark, having chosen a song which surely even a cursory knowledge of French would have told you, was espousing the view that one should never regret anything in life using that as a stepping stone to go on and express regret that he'd never learned to understand the lyrics of the fucking song he was addressing. But never mind. 
It is nevertheless, it's not an attractive thing to say that you, you, uh, that you regret. Some people feel that you shouldn't regret, but even Frank Sinatra, with all his bullishness, always disowned him, his, the lyrics of his, his famous song, My Way, in which he says, regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. The reality is we do all regret. Regret is a very human thing, and it can rouse us, as others said, to heights of envy which do indeed precipitate action. There was a famous character in a film about 30 years ago, which to you, of course, is like somebody, when I was your age, talking about a, a black and white James John Wayne movie. But there was a movie called Wall Street, which in hindsight seems rather quaint now as an expression of capitalism, but at the time seemed like a, a terrifying vision of its red in tooth and claw nature. Gordon Gecko, played by Michael Douglas, famously made a speech to some shareholders asking them to rid themselves of profiteering uh, board members in which he said, greed is good, don't be afraid of being motivated by greed, greed is good, it's the clarifying agent in matters of business, you've nothing to fear from being motivated by greed. Some of these board members, he said, are clearing $200,000 a year. And that was a shocking sum at that time. <laughs> $200,000 a year, I imagine, is what most of you are uh, hoping to hit uh, as a starting salary when you finally <laughs> leave these hallowed halls. And that's not just in line with inflation, but that's how things have progressed. Greed, envy, these kind of things can actually, of course, make you... Uh, they, they can motivate you, there's no question about that. If you see other people doing well, you're determined to do well yourself. But regret itself is also something to be savoured and enjoyed, and it's, it has that kind of acquired taste of a fine red wine, I think. You can roll a little bit of regret around in your mouth. I ever spoke about children as being a source of regret. This is never acknowledged. I myself uh, left it too late to have children, but I've gone ahead and had them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and any fool who does so and says to you that it's... Uh, 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 that tries to convince you that it's an alloyed, an unalloyed pleasure, that it's a simple uh, stroll in the sunshine, well, it's absolute nonsense. We have two children. And, I mean, I remember when I met my wife, it was about uh, 16 years ago now, she moved in as a lodger initially, that's how we met. I just bought her a little flat in North London, she moved in as a lodger, it's a rather sweet story. One week the rent fell a bit short, one thing led to another, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because that's what you had to do in the days before internet dating, so had a bit of a honey trap. It's all very well for you people, you can just fill in a form, compatibility and so on, I had to use cunning. <laughs> cash point around here at this time and I don't I wouldn't recommend it no. <laughs> have a glass of sherry let's see if we can work something out but we did work it out very well but the thing was I looked around at my friends and I envied what what seemed to me to be their success in producing progeny I thought this was an example of success and of course I wished to emulate them and so we had children and uh, what went from being a beatific lifestyle the next thing you know you're running a small badly funded correctional facility together that's all it is <laughs> for the next 15 years this is, where, this is where regretting your friend's success get you, because the reality is you don't see the full picture. This is the problem. This is what success is. We live today in a world created by mimetic desire. It was identified several years ago by a man named Peter Thiel. You may know him. He's a, a right-wing millionaire, billionaire, in fact, in America, who funds a lot of quite extreme right-wing political activity. He helped create the algorithms which make Facebook such an addictive proposition, because Facebook basically works by allowing people to present you with their showreel. You see all the very best things that they do. You see them on the beach. You don't see them having a row. You see their beautifully presented muesli fresh fruit and uh, a natural rogget uh, breakfast, and you don't see them scraping their tongues with a vicious uh, blade because their hangover is beyond repair. You don't see this kind of crap. Peter Thiel and his mimetic desire algorithms now rule our world. Our heads are full of this crap the whole time, but you don't understand it, and so you regret the success of your friends because you've not fully visualised it and then you follow their path and you realise that having kids is hell. So, <laughs> my point to you is, regret is unavoidable. You will regret the success of your friends. You regret that you regret the success of your friends, but it's unavoidable and to pretend otherwise is a violent act to your fellow humans who consider themselves to be somehow faulty for not feeling as beatific towards others as you do yourself. I endorse this message and I urge you to vote with the House. Thank you.